I'm going to tell you the same story that you already know, but in a different language, the language of science. Well, we've opened that channel as a kind of a metaphoric way to say it between mm -hmm. the heart intuition and, and the, uh, the, you know, the mind. It used to be th thought and taught that the heart was like a metronome, right? That the, basically the heart rate was always the same unless we Keeping did Keeping time, yeah. That's completely wrong. That the heart appears to have infrared access to a field of information outside the boundaries of time and space. Welcome to KanaCast, a series of conversations with residents and visitors to Kanha Shantivana, the International Heartfulness Center near Hyderabad, Telangana, India. Today I'm speaking to Roland McCready. He is the director of research at the HeartMath Institute and is a psychophysiologist whose interests include the physiology of emotion and how emotions can influence cognitive processes. He's also interested in exploring the connectivity between people and the Earth's energetic systems. Among other things, the HeartMath Institute also manufactures sensors which measure a value called coherence. This is related to vibratory patterns. Roland was at Kanha Shantivanam for the Global Spirituality Mahotsav. So thank you so much, Roland, for taking time out and coming to the studio. You know, you were just, uh, you were just saying how you're recovering from the, uh, from the time difference. Yeah. And it's your first travel after the, the pandemic. First, the first trip I've taken since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. And what, what a fun adventure this has been. It's my first time in India. Wow. So, well, so um, why is it so important to you? Why did you feel it's so important to join this global spirituality Mahotsu? Well, a lot of reasons. Um, probably the most true answer to that from my perspective is that the state of the planet we're in right now and um, the shift that, the shift in consciousness that's occurring is kind of going through its peak from my perspective, uh, the way I see it. And so it's what's driving a lot of the chaos and the extreme separation that we see that but at the same time it's like there's two worlds going on one if, it, if that makes sense to you one is the the, the extremism the, the separation sure, that's going on sure. but also right in the middle of that is another co type of consciousness emerging uh, i think that heartfulness is all about as well and certainly heart math is but it's a simple way of saying it is it's time for love to go viral and that's really the shift uh, where the the head and the heart finally merge, and the the mind surrenders to the intelligence of the heart, and uh, so we become more. Well, basically, we just have to learn to get along with each other. It's kind of our next step. And the, from uh, what our research suggests, and my own personal experience, the only thing that's going to to really finally bail us out is is when we start loving more. Um, and that, I know that can sound kind of, I don't know, uh, new agey or something, but that, yeah. It's That's a, not what I mean. I'm talking about a new vibration that lifts us above our pettiness and our biases to where we can uh, learn to get along with each other. And even if we don't agree with someone, uh, it doesn't mean that we can't connect in the heart. And uh, That's so beautiful. I hope that made sense. Though. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, you spoke about how, uh, you know, uh, the public perception, the popular perception, you could say, is that the world is uh, collapsing and there's so much division and divisiveness. But you're saying there's a second thing going on, which yeah. is not so visible. Yeah, and when it, it even it's in, it is visible in some ways. Mm. If it's not what the media likes to focus on, sure. But it it's um, I mean, this conference is a great example. Look, this is emerging in the middle of what some would say the chaos of the world and, and the separation. But here's a conference to really bring all the different religions together and, and including the science that's going on of, of why I'm here. Um, so that's a great example. I, I think there's more compassion maybe right now on the planet than certainly in my lifetime that I've ever seen. Um, uh, so it's, uh, I mean, we've got the, like the pandemic that evoked massive amounts of compassion. I mean, we had all the, the problems, but I don't know how it was here in India, but in the United States, there were at the hospitals, you know, people lining the streets to clap for the nurses and, and uh, you know, a real, real support for that going on at the same time. And even with the wars that we have now, um, the compassion that's going out from people and uh, 
you know, there's really a call for a change. I mean, I think for a lot of people and the new kind of consciousness that's emerging, it's it's almost inconceivable that we're still having wars. You know what I mean? It's, Absolutely. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And uh, this campus, uh, what are your first impressions of it? You've been here for a yeah. while now. I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm blown away by this campus and uh, um, the creativity, uh, the care that's gone into this. And it, it's amazing that I think this, um, I had a dinner with Daji the other night, that this all started in what, 2014, 2015? That's right. That's right. And uh, to see the, the the scale of it, I was telling my my wife and some friends, you know, taking some pictures. They want to see pictures, but they can't begin to capture the magnitude and uh, of what what's happening here. Um, I mean, just little things like a rainforest in the middle of it, what was a desert, you know, um, absolutely all of these types of things. That I mean, just just one of you know many many things that uh, so I'm blown away actually by what's been created here. And you've also been meeting a lot of the leaders who are here, the uh, different spiritual teachers, guides, and also scientists like yourself. Mm -hmm. And you met Daji as well. How did that go? Oh, I loved meeting Daji, and, and uh, um, I was honored to have dinner at his home the other night. And, and uh, I gave him one of our devices that measures the heart rate, durability of the heart rhythm, and measures what we call heart coherence. And he surprised me. We went into his office and he said, okay, let's try it. <laughs> so we did a, um, a long meditation that he led, you know, heartfulness meditation. And uh, I was wearing the device. And, and uh, so then afterwards, he wanted to see what the results were. And, and uh, so I recorded it. So I took him through and showed him that during the relaxation part, that uh, I, I know you're familiar with. Yes, that, yes. That the coherence was quite low, which is very typical. The relaxation doesn't tend to take you into heart coherence. But then after that was over, and then we shifted into the focusing in the heart, then uh, the coherence went way up, and uh, and then it typically varies on kind of even though you're in a high coherence, it's not this steady straight thing. We go up and down through coherence, but uh, so I showed him the patterns of it, and, and I was also able to reflect my inner experience of uh, what was going on during the different phases, and he was like, he was kind of <laughs> he was kind of blown away, I think, by by how the coherence measures on the app tracked what from his perspective he was doing whether it was cleaning or this or that mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. coherence changes so yeah you yeah. mentioned for a lot of people you know uh, stuff sounds very esoteric it may be like a little way out that love mm -hmm. can help but uh, with your measurements and with your devices you have brought it into the domain of science that is what yeah. you are attempting to do yeah ab absolutely you know you know I'm doing a um, I guess a uh, Semi keynote. I'm not sure what you call it. That's why I was invited. <laughs> uh, I understood all the politics going on here. Um, tomorrow I've got a 45 minute session uh, in one of the satellites. It's just um, a longer presentation. And I've been kind of pondering how I'm going to approach that. Mm -hmm. I think the way I'm going to set it up is that I'm going to tell you the same story that you already know, but in a different language, the language of science that is coming to the same conclusion. And um, anyway, I think that's the way I'm going to go. That's beautiful. That. So our, our research, I mean, we've been, I've been director of research now for the HeartMath Institute for I don't know, over 30 years. So I've uh, learned a lot in that, that journey. And, you know, in, the, in 30, 45 minutes, you can only kind of cover some of the, you know, sure, tip sure. of the icebergs, uh, of of connecting some of the dots. Um, but our, it, it's really now evolved to span, you know, I would think of as our personal level of coherence. Coherence just meaning uh, the harmonious interaction and cooperation of the systems within our body, mm -hmm. especially the head and heart. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's something we can measure. Yeah. So for people who aren't familiar with heart coherence, that is yeah. what it means. Yeah. Ultimately, coherence is a, I think most people have an intuitive sense of, you hear the word coherence and something good. Yes. <laughs> probably, right? <laughs> And, um, you know, if you look it up in the dictionary, the first definition is just usually something to do with the quality of one's speech. So hopefully I'm putting my words together in a structure that conveys a coherent meaning during, during this conversation we're having. And if I hadn't gotten much sleep last night, which I didn't get a lot <laughs> enough, or um, not that that would go on here, but had a little bit too much to drink and you're uttering nonsense, what do we say? You're, 
incoherent. Absolutely. Utterly nonsense. Absolutely. Right? Well, it's um, very similar in physics and, and in science. And in this case, in the, the context of a, a sentence, we're putting the words together in a way that have a coherent, something that's more than the sum of the words, right? Um, so that's one of the key concepts in, a, in coherence. And it's used in science, everything from the very small, the molecular, uh, to the universe. Um, that the concept of coherence that has to do with the harmonious or not order uh, of the, the parts that make up this larger system. So one of the concepts embedded in, in coherence is that the wholeness or the output is greater than the sum of the parts. So to have coherence, you have to have communication between the systems, the parts that make up the larger wholeness. And uh, so when you think about the human body, extremely complex, the communication that has to be occurring for us to be any living system, really, let alone a human, from the uh, very small, right, right down to the quantum, has to spin up into particles, which have to group together to make molecules, which have to come together to make basically ultimately organs. Then the organs have to play together well, right, within the body. So you see the massive amounts of coordination and communication Absolutely. that has to be going on across scale from the very small to, to, to a wholeness of our organism and be stable. That's what we would call a coherent system. Absolutely. Does it make sense? Absolutely. But then we can also take coherence, which we do in our, our work. It's really three, I would say, spheres that we study, is the our relationships, our social uh, dimensions. We can now look at coherence in a family or in a work team or a leadership team or any kind of team or group of people. How coherent are the relationships within that team? And I think everybody's probably had the experience, or most people anyway, of working in a team that was incoherent. Sure. Right? Uh, versus a coherent one, you know. And one, you can't wait to go to work and to connect, and, or, or whether you're volunteering or a job, or the other one, it's like you dread it, right? And what's the efficiency, the output of the, of the difference in those two, right? Um, so that we, we actually have measures of coherence at any of these levels. And then the third sphere, uh, is global, what we call global coherence. And that's been the most recent kind of last probably 15 years of our, our research. And we keep adding new tools to the toolbox for, mm -hmm. uh, for measuring the coherence of really humanity and, and the interconnection with humanity, uh, all of us as individuals, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the earth itself, the, the fields of the earth, the magnetic fields and the rhythms and, and, uh, at each one of these levels um, has been just fantastic surprises. You know, yeah, it uh, sounds uh, absolutely fascinating. I mean, and especially when you speak of it at the global level, there is the yeah. global coherence monitoring um, yeah. uh, that HeartMath is doing. Right. We have, so we started a project called the Global Coherence Initiative. God, I'm horrible with past time dates. So um, at least 15 years ago, somewhere in that. Somewhere in the distant past, far, yes. far away. Long ago. Yeah, right. And that's it started um, with a hypothesis, as we do in science. And to measure the interconnection, energetic, I should say, interconnection. I used to be clear, I'm not talking about internets and connecting mm -hmm. that way, but energetic connection between us, humanity, and the Earth's vibrational systems and that can sound like a what vibrational system i'm talking literal magnetic fields so we all live within magnetic fields of earth uh, there's several kind of kind of key ones uh, just to give you an example uh, well to, first of all to measure this we had to create magnetic monitoring sites around the world so i wish we hadn't had to do this ourselves it was not easy and not not cheap to do but these are ultra-sensitive devices called magnetometers that are specifically designed to measure the what are called resonant frequencies, the vibrating frequencies in the, the fields of the Earth. So are different than the other types of magnetometers that, that are, there's a lot of them around, but not to, to do this. So this has become the only time-synchronized, calibrated global system that, in the world that I know of. Wow. So we have sites in uh, northern Canada, California, New Zealand, um, Saudi Arabia, Lithuania, um, probably forgetting some here, but you get the point. It's kind of like so measuring the all over all the over globe. the world. 
Now, the reason this is important, um, I'll kind of mix in some of the hypothesis and results all at once if I, if I can here. Of course, please. That might make it a little easier to, to, for people to digest. Yeah. My previous career, by the way, was a communication engineer. So mm-hmm. I used to work for Motorola, and you know, uh, so I was a professional uh, at using magnetic fields to carry information. Right. So I, you know you, how radios work, right? Absolutely, or, or, absolutely. Or any, what we're doing now. Yes, yes. Um, so we all live within the geomagnetic field. I think most people know what that is: the North Pole, the absolutely, South Pole, absolutely, right? and yeah. uh, compass tunes into that that field. And you, you you can't escape it if you're on Earth. Even if you're in a space station, you're still within that that field and even as uh, what i'm about to tell you i didn't learn till much later even as a professional communication engineer i didn't know this but um i'm gonna maybe do it this way most of us i think if we time travel back to science class right and put iron filings on a glass plate yes, you put your put magnet, the magnet. Under, yeah yeah sure and the yeah. patterns form and, yeah, and the patterns them. form whether it's a horseshoe or a bar mm. but that's um that same simple experiment also allows us to visualize something else, not just the shape and the size of the field, but mag- what are called magnetic field lines. Right? So if you remember, those iron filings line up in parallel lines. Yes, yes, yes. So that's also showing what are called magnetic field lines. Hmm. Now, here's the thing that I didn't learn until much later, um, and there's a name for this called field line resonances. You can pluck a magnetic field line and it vibrates just like a guitar string. Oh. Right? So, and, and how do you do the plucking? Well, okay, at the scale of Earth, <laughs> the solar wind rushing by at a million miles per hour. I don't know if that is in kilometers. And Earth is turning in that. The sun mm-hmm. is turning. It's this complex interaction. Mm-hmm. So the field lines are, are vibrating. Ah, okay. And so, of course, it, just like a, a, any stringed instrument, I'll just use guitar, the length of the string and how the tension on it determines its resonant frequency. Absolutely. Yeah. The note, yeah. right? whether we call it C or E or whatever. Yes. All yes, we're yes. describing is letters to describe frequencies of vibration. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so the field lines of Earth are very long. So they have a low frequency. And in frequency language, there's a, there's a range of them. And as it turns out, they all overlap uh, human heart rhythm, cardiovascular and, and nervous system rhythms. But the primary resonant node frequency of the field lines vibrating of Earth in frequency language is 0.1 hertz. Okay, so that, what that translates to in time is one cycle every 10 seconds. Okay, which is a very low frequency. Right, but here's the, the amazing thing, and I was, Nobody ever put the dots together, even though field line resonance were known and studied in that its field, right? Meanwhile, people like me and others were studying the human heart, heart rhythms and all that. Well, as it turns out, when we're in a heart coherent state, the frequency of the human heart rhythm is 0.1 hertz. Wow. It's exactly the same frequency. Wow. Okay. Um, now we shift in, we naturally go into, physiologically speaking, into heart coherence when we feel good. So this is how we got onto this back in the early 90s, kind of how what started as our people kind of getting drawn to our work when we showed that when we're, we have heartfelt feelings of appreciation or kindness or compassion or love, we natu- our physiology dramatically changes into an, op- we now know it's an optimal state that's mm. called heart coherence. And that's where we're at this frequency of 0.1 hertz. So that, that frequency actually impacts our physiology. Oh, it's, 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 the, it's our literal resonant frequency. Mm. See, as, as humans, we, have a re- we do actually have a resonant frequency. And this has to do with the neural communication links between the heart and the intrinsic cardiac nervous system or the heart brain, the lungs and the brain. And it's, so when we're in our optimal state, we're vibrating oscillating at, at our resonant frequency, which is the same as the primary frequency resonant of, frequency of, of Earth. Earth. Wow. Wow. Okay. Now, just out of curiosity, what is the what is the upper limit you've seen uh, of frequ- in an incoherent state of a heart frequency? Well, it's, it wouldn't be that it's an upper limit so much. Yeah, because anybody could do worse. <laughs> well, well, you see, the way to more, I think, 
picture's worth a thousand words here, but mm -hmm. um, when we're, if you're looking at the heart rhythm, mm -hmm. okay, uh, which I need to step back one one step here is that a lot of people think that it used to be th thought and taught that the heart was like a metronome, right? That the basically the heart rate was always the same unless we keeping did time, exercise. yeah. That's completely wrong. Okay, in a healthy person, resilient person, our heart rate is changing with each and every heartbeat, and this is what's called heart rate variability. Right, the time between each pair of beats is varying. In fact, this is what generates the heart rhythm. So, if you think about it, the time between each pair of heartbeats were the same. There would be no heart rhythm; it would just be a steady metronome rate. And that, in fact, that is the worst thing that you can have. Um, that, that is a super strong indicator of poor health, poor resilience, and, and, and uh, increased risk of really all types of major diseases. So, we want this natural variability. And so there's two, I'm not going to go a lot in here. I'll just to say that the amount of variability, the how much or the amplitude of the rhythm. Uh, most people are surprised just sitting still right now, like we are. If you actually were, if we had one of our devices and you were looking at it, you know, our heart rate's going, varying up and down, say from 60 to 80, you know, in, in a, yeah, say a yeah. younger person. So it's a lot of variability. Now, the younger we are, the more of this variability we have. And it gets less as we age. In fact, it's one of the best measures of the relationship between our physiological aging and our chronological aging. So it's a very well-known uh, relationship there. And if our variability starts becoming dropping lower faster than the normal aging relationship, that's what's a strong indicator of future health problems. And we know that the number one reason for lowered variability is accumulated stress. Mm. And I should probably say here that at least from the research perspective, stress is kind of a safe word we use. You know, you're stressing me out. I feel stressed. But stress is always an emotion. It's the feelings of frustration or impatience or anxiety or overwhelm. That's what stress is. And now this is um, I'm kind of weaving a few things together here. This is where heart-brain coherence becomes important because when we're uh, feeling things like, let's say, impatience, you know, it's common, right? It's We're only humans, we say to ourselves. Well, that impatience or the feelings of frustration are dramatically reflected in our heart rhythms, not in the amount, but in the pattern. Mm. So the rhythm starts looking like this very chaotic or jerky rhythm. And that is reflecting, literally now, a desynchronization in the activity in, in our nervous system, in our higher brain systems, and in the activity between the heart and the brain. And that's been, um, there's a term for this, it was long before I came along, to describe this effect, even though the mechanisms weren't understood back then, this is going back to the, the 70s, and that was called cortical, meaning the top part of our brain, the cortex, inhibition. Cortex doesn't work well when we're in that desynchronized or incoherent mm. state. That's reflected in the heart rhythms. Okay, now let me weave another part in here. And what I'm about to say is going to sound like, could sound like some new big discovery, but it's actually not. This has been known since the late 1800s. And that is that the heart sends far more information through the neural nervous system to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. Mm. And those neural signals, the, the afferent in neuroscience language, but ascending signals go up to the brain, to every major brain center. So when we're in that incoherent heart state, there's more, very, several really important pathways, but the one that I'll talk about here goes to a part of the brain called the thalamus. It has a lot of jobs, the thalamus, the very core of our, our brain. One of those uh, roles it has is to synchronize the electrical activity of all the neurons in our brain globally. Okay, So when we're in that uh, incoherent state, those chaotic patterns are going directly to the thalamus, and they interfere with its ability to synchronize neural activity in the brain. Court, thus, the term cortical inhibition. Now, this shows up in uh, very measurable things like our reaction times, our coordination, um, these types of tests have uh, been done in labs all over the world now, including ours. But that's not the most important 
facts or, or uh, I mean, it's important if you're an athlete yeah, or sure, things like sure. this, but the front part of our brain, frontal, frontal and prefrontal cortex, um, you know, we've been another part of the story here. One of my, I've been fortunate to have a lot of awesome mentors in my career. And, and one of those was a, a guy named Dr. Carl Prebram, a pretty famous neuroscientist. Um, and I won't go into a lot of stories here about Carl, but what, um, in fact, he's the guy who coined the term executive functions for the frontal cortex and the holographic perception theory was all Dr. Prebram. And, and uh, he got drawn to our, our work very early on and spent every year he would come spend a week or two at our, our place. And, but anyway, that, that's a little bit of a sidetrack. What I learned from Carl, uh, most of what I know about the brain, I, that I really know about the brain, the deeper I learned from, from him, is the frontal, what, the way to think of what the frontal part of our brain gives us, the frontal cortex, the, the function it gives us, is foresight. Okay? Mm. So you think about that, it makes a lot of sense, right? That's a, a capacity that as humans we have that our beloved pets don't. They have great memory of the past. Sure. But foresight is the ability to understand how our actions in the now are going to affect the future. Right, so planning, goal setting, yeah, discrimination, absolutely of, crucial. Yeah, discrimination of appropriate yeah. behavior. Not a good idea to hit the boss if you want to keep your job, right? <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, I mean that sounds silly, but it's, but those are the when we're in that incoherent state. Those are the functions that are taken offline, right? Because the, those those are quite refined capacities, and the simple way to think of it is the neural structures that underlie them have to be well synchronized for them to function optimally. So we, we get angry or frustrated, throws our autonomic system into, into a sort of chaos, that incoherence. So signal goes to the, up to the thalamus, takes those functions offline. So I can, I can say this two ways. Um, this is why another, an otherwise very intelligent individual can make uh, poor choices. Absolutely. When we they're see emotionally that. upset. We see that all the time. Yeah. Or I can say it kind of like it is. It's why anger makes us do stupid things. Mm -hmm. Right. And we see this all the time. But this is, it's really being driven by the heart. Absolutely. See, and Absolutely. this is a, a surprise. And so even a police officer, or we, we do a lot of training in law enforcement, first responders can understand this. Right. And, and it's a practice that they can do what we call heart focused breathing as step one of our techniques to get themselves back in or, or shift into a coherent state. So now you're sending a, when you're in that coherent heart rhythm, it's, it looks like smooth rolling hills. It's radically different than that chaotic state. Now that's the signal you're sending to the thalamus, which actually facilitates cortical synchronization above and beyond our normal walking around state, which is somewhere in between. Mm. Mm. So suddenly we're, we have our capacity to discriminate is greatly enhanced to make better decisions. Um, it's making sense. Absolutely, of. absolutely. So, I mean, the picture I'm getting is like it's like an orchestra, and uh, one yeah. instrument just decides. Well, yeah, and the heart is the is the conductor. Yes, and the conductor loses it, and everybody goes out of tune yeah. and goes out right. of time and everything. And it's a great analogy. But the good news is that uh, the heart math techniques. The yeah, well, I, I think any heart focused practice. Yeah, they're just getting the substitute yeah. conductor up there, and yeah, in it, in a simple way, just learning to love more, to appreciate mm. more. Uh, mm. Invoking feelings of kindness naturally takes us into um, coherence. Mm. You know, and I, and I love when I say love needs to go viral. Viral, I really mean that. But let's break that down. What does that mean? Mm. You know, to me, because because love is, I look at it as an octave mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. frequencies. But high up in that spectrum are things like compassion, kindness, appreciation, gratitude. So I know love can sound like this lofty thing, but Absolutely. it really it really breaks down to caring more. You know, Absolutely, just having more care, kind of give a darn. Um, <laughs> yes, it's not what I would typically say, but um, <laughs> trying to be polite here. But you know what I mean? It's really um, having the care to yeah. appreciate to um, others, to li listen more deeply, to be kinder is really what. Um, that mean when we say love going viral. It's very practical.
absolutely but many would uh, think that this is something that is these qualities come naturally it is not something that can be cultivated but do you think that's that's well oh, absolutely can be cultivated mm -hmm. i mean there are over 500 independent research studies meaning studies that have been done outside of our research that have shown that you can learn to be that you through techniques uh, like the heart coherence techniques, uh, the heart math, but, but it's not just about heart math. Anything that takes you more heartfulness, that's why I'm here, it's such a resonance between heartfulness and, and heart math, um, or compassion meditations, or loving kindness. Yeah, all these know. spiritual yeah. techniques that have been taught down the yeah, ages. Yeah, they all take you into a more coherent mm -hmm. state. But I think in today's world, a lot of people have, have looked at, you know, in the idea of the heart uh, as a source of courage or you know, or, or ask your heart. These sayings have been in our language for, well, thousands of years in some cases, but they've become a metaphor for a lot of people. Not uh, and what our research is showing is no, this is literal. Wow. Um, well, you and you have uh, machines that measure it. Yeah, yeah. We have a lot of stuff in the lab. We, I mean, we have a very well equipped lab for machines. Yes, yes. We uh, once we started to understand these dynamics, we're able to make very inexpensive in simple devices that people can get the feedback on how coherent they are yeah. and and practice and then um it takes me probably down another lane here but um is what happens well let me before i go there remind me because about baseline shifts that we, we well, basically we can train our nervous system to where um coherence becomes the new familiar Mm. Or what, and so when we start getting out of that state, it feels uncomfortable because mm. most of us in the world are adapted the other way. Yeah, we that, want to be stressed. Through. <laughs> yeah, well, well, incoherent is familiar and yeah. therefore comfortable. Yeah, right. So it takes some work to to shift that that inner baseline. But let me, I think what for especially for what we're talking about here and the importance of this this conference. One of the things that we would still do this day, but. Uh, you know, going back to the mid late nineties, and we were starting to do trainings in various populations, companies, and schools, and things to, to teaching coherent heart coherence techniques, which are basically self regulation techniques. But to self regulate, not because somebody told us we should, because of our own inner intelligence, right? Um, connecting with our deeper heart. But what we were hearing in then and still today is that when people practice the techniques for a bit is they, they say, I've heard this from th well, hundreds of thousands of people now, is that my intuition is dramatically changed. Uh, this is not subtle. Mm. And then usually the second thing is, and synchronicities are, be I become a way of life after the coherence practices. And uh, uh, that was certainly true for me and I think most of us. Uh, yeah, I mean, for many of us doing heartfulness that we say that, uh, yeah. you know. Well, right. So the more we practice, we like, Listen, yeah. well, I was just thinking of that person. That person showed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those are, so we, yeah. um, we have done quite a bit of research then and in the lab now. I'm going to take it into the lab. And what, um, I won't go into all three here because of time, but basically there's three types of intuition from uh, our research and, and others in, in the field. Um, implicit learning or knowledge is one type. And that's all about the brain and the brain accessing unconscious memories and things. Uh, it's an important aspect of intuition. And the second type I call energetic sensitivity. And that's our nervous system's ability to receive and respond to very real and often measurable signals in the environment. Okay. Um, empathy would be in that category. Um, or uh, friends or people that can feel, I'm California, right? Earthquakes coming. Mm. We now know you can measure changes in the Earth's magnetic field that are, that happen before earthquakes occur. So it's our ability to sense those. Okay, and there's a lot of examples, but the the last category, the one that's more relevant here, is I call it just because I don't have a better word for it yet, non-local intuition. And this is the heart intuition is in this category, and these are the types of intuition that you can't explain away through the other two types. Mm. Right. So usually something to do with uh, across time or in the future or long space, right? Um, like mothers who know their children are in distress and they're on the other side of the planet. Yeah. Right? Or yeah. the town, these mm. kinds of things. Many, many examples. So what we, I won't go into all the gory details for those that want to dig into the science of this. It's all published in, in, on our website and things to pay a lot of hundreds of papers that people can download. 
that the what we did is we put um, you know electrodes measured the brain waves EEG and of course the, the heart uh, and skin conductance and these kind of measures and the first set of protocols we spent a few years doing this people were at a computer and uh, so you're recording all the data so the, you're recording the, the EEG the heart all this stuff right and then the computer would show them uh, a photo a picture an image and it was um, these are images that are uh, derived from what's called the International Effective Picture Set. So they're images that are well-researched to evoke different types of emotions and intensities of those emotions. So uh, anyway, you're recording the data, then the computer would randomly select an image from th the two opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, like either on the yucky ones, I'll call it, mm -hmm. snake striking mm -hmm. a screen or... Mm -hmm. You know, bad guys with a knife at a woman's throat. You know, these kind of edgy, as, as yeah, you yeah. could get them and want to feel them to people. And on the other end of the, ca the spectrum are nature scenes and flowers and, you know, bunny rabbits, things like that. So um, I'm, I'm going to cut to the chase here because we did a lot of work on this. But what we found, and before you see the image, uh, well, a key thing, though, is that no one in, no one can possibly know what the future image is going to be. Because the computer is selecting it randomly. Yeah. Well, well you know, and the computer is, yes, randomly, but a true mm. random process. So the computer doesn't, it's not pre-programmed. It doesn't even know what the image is going to be till after the data has been collected. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we found, long story short, is that the heart is the first system in the body to get the, 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 the intuitive information about the future. The heart sends a measurably different signal through the nervous system to the brain. Then you get a brain response you know, sometime after the heart, and then you get a body response. Ah. So the gut feeling, the hair on the back of the neck, and that's when it becomes conscious feeling if you're paying attention. Okay, so the gut gets the credit, but it's really heart, brain, then body, then conscious feeling. Mm. And the heart... Um, is way more accurate at, I mean, if you try and guess, you know, you're, you're, a lot of, you're not even 50 50 because of the way the experiment's set up. Mm -hmm. but, but the mm -hmm. heart's, in this case, 80% accurate in predicting the future picture. Wow. So it's actually reacting before the image is gone. Yeah. That's yeah, and insane. depending upon the, the, the experimental protocol. It's like a first responder who's on his way before the call. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. I mean, and this, this is always going on if people, wow. are, but we're two, we have all three types. Hmm. And some people are more, familiar or synced up with one type than another, but we really uh, I want all three types. Now, an important part of that story is we did these experiments, um, the first kind of published studies with, with 30 people. It's a huge undertaking to all these measurements. Of course. Uh, and you have to be accurate. Yeah, we, but we did it twice yeah. with the same people. And uh, for the scientists out there in a counterbalanced way, that I mean, that, I mean something to some people, but... So one time they, they would come into the lab and we'd be nice to them and kind, you know, get them wired up and do all that stuff. And okay, now here's the protocol, go do your thing. And the other time we would get them wired up then just take a few minutes and have them do what we call a heart lock-in. It's a form of heart meditation, not unlike heartfulness in, in many ways, but where you, you know, do heart-focused breathing, it, it starts you into the coherent state and then you basically activate feelings of appreciation and, or love and, and to yourself and others. Uh, just for a few minutes before the experiment. So we wanted to see, is there a difference between our normal state and being in, because everybody was talking about the coherence practice mm -hmm. is what, mm -hmm. you know, and there was, it was a huge difference. That channel, the energetic channel between the heart and brain was dramatically, uh, the, what you would see the brain responses to the heart signals was dramatically different if you were coherent first. Well, so I've interpreted this as a, in a measurable way, we've, uh, we've, Open that channel as a kind of a metaphoric way to say it between mm. the, the heart intuition and, and the, uh, the, you know, the mind or, or literally the brain and the mm -hmm. measuring the brain responses. And the way I got that published, this is late 90s you know, back then, that's a, uh, was to say that the heart appears to have access to a field of information outside the boundaries of time and space. So that, in that era, that was perfectly acceptable language. For science, you know, peer-reviewed scientific yes, terms, yes. right? Because uh, things like non-locality and all this had been experimentally proven. This is around the time that that was all going on. You know, but at that time, that was only supposed to occur with photons or electron subatomic scale things. Mm -hmm. That's no longer. We've way blown past that in, in the quantum physics community now that 
you know, whole groups of atoms and macro scales have been shown to do it. We were just showing the same effects, you know, in parts <laughs> in people you know, long before before that. So I would often ask them in a presentation, well, what is the, what do you think? What what do you perceive as a field of information mm. outside the boundaries of time and space? And, uh, interesting, you get all kinds of answers, <laughs> and uh, but I'm way more out of the closet uh, these days. I mean, that's literally I'm saying that's the um, well. Let me, let me say it this way: what I'm s suggesting through most of my own experience in, and uh, what the, the data is is really indicating is that we have two hearts: mm. the physical heart which we have has its own neural structures and all this stuff of course but also the energetic heart which has been called the spiritual heart in a lot of the mm, yes religious yes. and spiritual traditions for yes. thousands of years i'm just saying it's real and that it has its own structure and it exists in a different like the way i think of it dimension of density that you can't put under a microscope mm. you can't put a thought under a microscope or an emotion or an intuition but we all know we have them right mm. what we can measure the physiological correlations with those experiences but you you can't you can't even measure a magnetic field directly it's only the effect it has on an instrument right anyway it's a little bit off the topic so what i'm suggesting here and what the data suggests as well i think this those series of experiments they've been replicated by the way yes, in other yes, labs yes, yes. so this is i'm pretty confident here yeah that the heart the energetic heart i'm suggesting is literally the bridge to our larger self whether you want to call that your higher self or your soul or your spirit, mm -hmm. um, well, there are different structures there, and that we've done a, a, a other round yeah. of experiments. Those are words that usually scientists shun, you know. Yeah, but <laughs> I'm but I'm follow the data. Yeah. So we get a, and I'm weaving so many things together here. I hope this is coming across somewhat coherently. <laughs> uh, another round of experiments before that, showing that when we're in a heart coherent state and with intention. We can actually cause in modulations in DNA, unwinding or unwinding. That's another set wow. of experiments. Wow. But, but what I'm, you know, part, I'm taking my science hat off a little bit here, and part of it's inner experience of myself and, and others, but it's the energetic heart level that is in communication with all the DNA in all the cells. Uh, wow. It's like a radio wave, kind of think of it that way. It kind of is like that, it's not traditional radio waves, but it's an energetic communication. So that's where, you know, one of the big surprises in mapping the, the genome was that there's not enough base pairs to explain, right, where's the missing information, mm -hmm. right? Um, it was a big surprise, but so I'm suggesting that, that it that's is- That's the energetic heart. It's at the energetic heart is where mm -hmm. that, I mean, the, at the physical level, the DNA, yes, it has the, the blueprint, if you will, for our eye color and, you know, male, female, all those kinds of things, but the, the who we really are level, right? That's at the energetic heart. You know, I, mean, I mean, who are, when we go deep in the heart and talk to ourselves, who are we talking to anyway? Absolutely. Right? So, you know what I'm saying that's the energetic heart is the bridge to that. And it, through the heart coherence practices, I'm using that language because physiologically that's what we can measure, whether it's heartfulness or heart math or loving kindness. Um, we're opening that channel. So we're, now we're starting to increase the flow of information from our our larger self down into the mind in, into our humanness here humanness, on earth in this, yeah. in this level of density and that is what evolves consciousness you know our own personal individual consciousness and, and this is what's so wonderful about it we all have a heart and we, we're all at different places on our journey in the evolution of consciousness right the number of lifetimes we've been here or that so um, this is absolutely fascinating. Is this I, make, making sense to you? Yes, it's absolutely making sense, and it's uh, completely blowing me away because <laughs> it's it's uh, it's so much uh, so much uh, research you've done on this, it, and it's actually bringing stuff that people have been saying and people have right. been and what you said right at the beginning. It's uh, saying what you already know, but in a different language, yeah. and uh, it's surprising once it has that validation, somehow it becomes more. Uh, yeah. acceptable well that and, and i i've heard this from many people over the years so one of the things i hear most if i'm speaking to a lay audience uh, like i'd be doing here at this, at this conference not a lot of scientists here but <laughs> which is the finest is really they say thank you for confirming what i already believed to be true and this gives me uh, more motivation or 
inspiration to really go deeper with the practices. Absolutely. But has it been easy gaining uh, the acceptance of the scientific community at large? Oh, Lord, no. Um, <laughs> well, it depends on which community you're in. And, mm -hmm. and you know, um, you know, in the psychophysiology community, in cardiology, quite well accepted. But I'm not talking about the soul and the spirit there. I'm talking about, you know, heart rate variability and patterns and how, you know, so this is, I mean, our, this is huge applications in medicine and health and medicine. So we, I mean, in heart math, we've got multiple certification, certification programs to train patients for doctors and programs for trauma specialists and programs for schools and educators. And uh, so we, uh, so results are there for people. To yeah, see yeah, and practical applications. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm somewhat intelligent about knowing who I'm talking to. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean. Read I'm, the room. <laughs> yeah, re read the room. I mean, I'm not going to talk about the conversation we're having with a bunch of police officers, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about how you can do hard focus breathing, how that takes you into this optimal, measurable state that you can see yourself on these devices, that will allow you to maintain your composure in the middle of the chaos that you're you're in, in the, so you don't make stupid choices. Mm. Right. And uh, yeah, they'll, they'll, I get that. Right. And, yeah. But guess what? Even if it's a hardcore, you know, police officer that, that wants nothing to do with spirituality or, you know, atheist doesn't matter. And they start practicing this. Well, that channel between the heart and brain or the energetic heart and, and, and the brain starts opening. So they, you know, and they start getting feedback. Wow. You've, be, you've just become a nicer person. You're kinder now. Uh, you're not as impatient. Um, you know, these kinds of things we hear it all the time, right? So it's kind of a backdoor into, mm. um, absolutely. you know, and I sometimes, you know, this is reminding me of your question, get accused of, you know, our research having to do with, you know, bridging, you know, science and spirituality. And I'm like, well, okay. If we think of spirituality as people evolving, maturing to be able to become more uh, more maintain their inner composure, their balance, becoming kinder, appreciative, deeper listening. Great. I'll, I'll, you can accuse me of that because, <laughs> that's, but that's really what it's about. Absolutely. You mentioned the evolution of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, consciousness is, of course, a term that's been debated for so long. Oh, yeah. We're still debating it. It's not. Well, of course. <laughs> In fact, Daji asked me to how I felt at conference, and I kind of, kind of regret the way I answered it. Because I was on the spot and a lot of people in the room, and I didn't want to take too much time. And uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, there that's been debated for I don't know since the Greeks. Right? Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. And so I'm not going to sit here and give a you know some answer that everybody's going to agree with. I wouldn't presume to, to do. I that. read a book in college called uh, which had uh, by the wonderful Daniel C. Dennett which had the mm -hmm. title Consciousness Explained. I oh, said, I read the book. I think it's absurd. <laughs> yeah. um, well, it's, and, he, and he would be coming from, this is, Dr. Prebum and I used to have many conversations around this, this very concept. And not that it's unique to him, but uh, I mean, this, we're going back a lot of years. And he said, well, the way I think of it, or Roland, is uh, we've got little c consciousness. And that's the kind of consciousness that neuroscientists and, you know, the, the mechanistic approach thinks that this, or we're talking about we're conscious when we're awake and we're unconscious when we're asleep. Okay, and that's fine. And that's true because yeah. you know, there's a certain level of awareness and um, self-regulation and control that's you know part of a conscious being. Um, you know, and we can debate you know the level of consciousness from that little C perspective that say a dog has or a horse or us and whatever. Uh, you know, but then he said then there's big C consciousness. You know, his way of thinking, which I, I think works, big C. So, I mean, and this is where there's a lot of debates, right? Is consciousness, uh, is there, I, I'll be honest, my way of thinking of consciousness is there's multiple levels and scales. I mean, there's our individual consciousness or awareness sure. that, that we mature and we evolve, uh, from my perspective, over lifetimes. So, you know, so many older souls here on the planet now for the shift that's going on and um, have, have had a lot of lifetimes to to evolve their personal consciousness to be more heart brain aligned, uh, you know, more in tune with their larger self, and bringing that that awareness and that understanding down into the density of, of the, the planet Earth, you know, the, that we live in here. Then I also think we have an, uh, in what we're measuring, which we haven't got into yet, in the, the, the energetic. We start. You asked me the question, and I went off in a completely different direction. I apologize for that, but. 
I, I tend to think of it and write about it as an extended type of consciousness. That is, you could think of as a collective consciousness that's kind of a baseline of humanity. Mm. Yeah, um, and that's kind of what we're getting at measuring now with the new Global Consciousness Project. Um, so that's its own story, but um, so that's another kind of consciousness. You know, it's been called the neosphere, you know, right? or these different um, uh, concepts that have been. I'm not. This is not unique to me. It, yeah, yeah. We're always looking for new names for yeah, things. I, I call it a global information field to kind of hmm. put more of a science hmm. term on it uh, that we're all contributing to. We're all affected by and contributing to, and that's kind of the baseline consciousness of Earth. And that's what's evolving. That's what's, I believe, what's why HeartMath exists, is to help facilitate that shift in that baseline consciousness of humanity and the planet and the way we're working together. And then, you know, we can dialogue and argue about or not. You know, there's another level of consciousness, which you could think of as the, the creator. Mm. Uh, and that's kind of you want to go ahead and use the G word <laughs> um, well I, I don't tend to use it because I think there's too much baggage in yeah the way too much baggage it. and it's it's uh, one of the the paucity of language makes us come yeah, to that that right. word but uh, you know it's I don't think it's in the human density we live in that it, that's even worth I mean to, waking up to who we really are you know getting the, at our uh, higher self level is huge. That's taking lifetimes. So to be w worried about who made that is mm -hmm. kind of, we're not going <laughs> to be able to even sort that out it's really until we make the shift here mm. to this level of consciousness. But, uh, you know, the, the level of intelligence uh, that uh, whatever that is that a creator had to have to create the universe and the gazillions plus of life forms in the universe is. Um, so I'd rather put my energy focusing on what I can do uh, in my own evolution and to help others through through this shift and squabbling about how we define those terms. But uh, I absolutely. hope that makes makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's really fascinating. I mean, if you had to hypothesize, uh, you could perhaps say things like, and I think a hypothesis always comes before a kind of a validation of it. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> you could. You could say that uh, maybe the energetic heart, mm -hmm. at some stage, uh, you end up uh, having one energetic heart. That's all that exists. Yeah, I don't. Uh, you mean like all people having one energetic heart? No, I mean not not at the, that particular energetic heart, but at a different level of engagement. When when you are engaging with, the, could it be? I mean, I, this yeah. is just uh, on a limb. I'm I'm going out on a limb. Could sure. it be that the energetic heart? There, there could be one energetic heart, and that one oneness yeah i my own intuition there is, mm. is no mm. um so i would say that i mean some things we're just are, some things are just wired the way they are you know some things are what they are and you can argue about it all you want but when the rubber meets the road it that's the way it is mm. uh, if that makes sense to you yeah yeah sure so i'm suggesting that we all have our physical heart and our energetic heart and it's it's really part of our undivided high our undivided wholeness. So my my say soul spirit level is mine and yours is yours. Mm -hmm. Right um, now above that that's you know there's another source that all got created from. That's what I'm saying. Let's not spend our time worrying about that just mm -hmm. now because we got enough to do to absolutely to wake up here in the density of, of, of Earth. Absolutely. So at that level, you know, um, and so the. You know, if this is correct, then you know we go through our many lifetimes, and uh, the the spirit soul level is also evolving and, and learning to be able to um, exist in and learn to wake up within the level of density of of, of Earth, you know, which is a very dense system compared to other mm. levels. So it's, it's, so it's, a, it's a to me, Earth is a is a a school that we get to go to. Uh, we've learned enough. That's an awesome opportunity, especially to be here now uh, during this time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the work that HeartMath has done is already uh, so amazing. And whoever's familiar with the work should ideally be blown away with it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they probably haven't understood it. Yeah. Uh, what is the focus right now for HeartMath and where, do, where does it go next? Well, uh, there's a couple of answers to that. Uh, really, uh, the one is that 
helping love go viral. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes. That, that's kind of we we really do exist um, to help facilitate the planetary shift in consciousness. And um, more power to you with that for and, sure. And it's from my perspective that that shift really is um, the mind finally surrendering to the intelligence of the heart, so that it's a partnership. Yeah, just don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying that the brain's bad or the or the mind. I'm not, I mean, really, the mind. Uh, no, I want it. I want a brain and a mind, and I want it to work well. Right? Absolutely. It's not. It's not a. Uh, but but it also needs uh, an upgrade in its operating system, and I kind of mean this literally. You know, the mind be like the software, and that's and when we really access the deeper heart, that that is what's going on. Is it's upgrading. The software, if you will, as a metaphor, the, the mind, so that you you have that aligned partnership. Because the mind's the big winner when we when we get the heart and mind in coherence, it starts getting the answers and the understandings that it Absolutely. that it can't until it it finally makes that that uh, um, con that connection that, that surrender, if you will. And so that's one of our, our our focuses. So we focus a lot on on very practical, simple. We we go to great lengths to make heart math techniques simple. So we can, in different wording and form, teach them to a kindergartner or generals or corporate executives just in, in different packaging. But it's really the same thing. Mm. You know, that's the straight line. You know, if we really are wired that way, and the, what I'm suggesting here, then so many things are distractions, really. Because a straight line is really going to the heart, into the, the deeper heart, and getting ourselves coherent. Because it's, um, you know, if I take communications, engineering my background there we can't radiate a signal unless it's a coherent signal i mean that's just it just is that way <laughs> you know you have mm. to have a standing wave um i know in heartfulness you talk about you know um, the transmission yeah. transmissions well if you don't have a coherent signal you're mm. not transmitting sure and it's from my experience and belief it's the same way energetically um, so what when we're evolving consciousness in this lifetime or whatever jumps we're making, it, we're really talking about increasing the vibration of our consciousness. Um, that, that is ultimately, yes. it, you know, whether yes. that ma manifests through different chakras and things, sure it does, and the energetic systems in the body. But at, uh, at a deeper level, it's really we're increasing the, the, the frequency, the vibration of a consciousness, which is... Um, as we align more with the energetic heart, and which is the bridge to who we really are at the deeper level, that is what uh, increases the vibration. It's, and we can call it consciousness, or we can make it more practical awareness. Hmm. You know, our awareness of who we are, of ourselves, what we're feeling, and what we're radiating. Absolutely. Um, which I said, so then it, that takes me down another track here, if I, if I may. Of course, uh, please. What we're radiating. So I'll tell you the real story of how this happened. Um, I don't, I don't usually have time or people aren't interested. We were doing um, another one of our men, my mentors was a pretty another pretty famous guy, William Tiller, who was head of, uh, he was the dean head of material science at Stanford. Ah, okay. And uh, he was into subtle energy research and things that really didn't, they didn't like because he's, you know, they couldn't do anything with him because he's, you know, tenured and brings in lots of funding and all that. But <laughs> anyway, he, he, he worked, after he retired, he worked in our lab for two or three years. And um, we were doing uh, water research at that time, looking at how our how our biofields can interact with water and we can measure changes and so on. And, and we'd set up this experiment. I won't go into the details, but basically we had an electrode in water and we were looking at changes in, in the water structure and things. And we found out that uh, when you had water in this system, that it was dramatically amplifying very weak electromagnetic fields. Okay. And you know, Dr. Taylor says, no, this can't be happening. Uh, the water can't do that. Uh, well, come on back to the lab here, Bill, and let's show you the experiment. And he's like, okay, it is doing it. Um, <laughs> so he went, he spent months, you know, developing a mathematical theory that explained it. And he finally did, you know, and he'd, he would do experiments that he had based. And anyway, that's kind of off the topic, but it's sort of the background. Um, this is what we, we had this little, basically a little gold electrode in water, you know, amplifying these fields that we could measure. And so we were just kind of hanging out one day and said, well, wow, we're, we're bags of water, basically. Humans, bodies. Absolutely. We, we must be, this must be one of the mechanisms, right, of how we're sensitive to all these environmental things. So we, uh, we got the idea, well, let's put an electrode in a glass of water 
based on the same equipment we had and see if we can measure our heartbeat in it without touching it, just sitting here in front of us. And we tried it and yeah, we could. Wow. It's actually pretty easy to do. It, wow. wasn't, it wasn't this big jump. And it was like, huh, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> uh, it's a signal averaging approach, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. So that was kind of like an aha. I mean, it, it was sort of a backwards way into it. You know, it, it's sort of now looking back on that era, it seems kind of silly that we had to, <laughs> we had to kind of come at it in a backwards way. It was so obvious. So the next step then was, well, that must mean that we're energetically communicating in a measurable way between us, right? So we started doing those experiments and uh, those were actually really easy to do as well. In other words, if we have, you know, you and I wired up brain waves and heartbeats and all that, we could see that we, there's an energetic communication hmm. going on between hmm. us right now, hmm. whether we know it or not, or whether it's below the, the radar of our consciousness. Sure. Sure. But, but a lot of the, the we're self, not aware of it. But. Yeah, but a lot of a lot of the self awareness work, from my perspective, is becoming more aware of what mm. used to be unaware or unconscious, right? Because you can learn the sensitivity to actually feel, and some people are very tuned into it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, in other words, we could see my, for example, my brain waves synchronizing to your heart, or vice versa, in this dance going back and forth. So, not only could we measure it, but we were seeing that the quality of it. like if i if you were to say you were in a coherent state that that would have an effect on measurable effect on me that helped lift me into a more coherent state so these were a whole round of experiments that were done uh, that have profound implications right now and, and of course i know we all know that we communicate through our body language and the tone of our voice and these kinds of things but what i'm saying here is there is a very real and measurable energetic level of communication that's always going on between people or within groups that uh, often is more important than the words that are said. Um, Absolutely. This is so fascinating. And this is something that uh, you call it a backwards approach, but I think it's just uh, it's just like a circle. So there's no backwards yeah, yeah, and forwards. Right. It's completing yeah. the circle. Yeah, right. There's one side of the circle is completed by the whole spiritual yeah. approach and by those terms. And the other side is completed with yeah. this. Yeah. And the so, parallels are, uh, are really amazing because the, what you spoke of coherence being the baseline state, that is the idea. Yeah, well, the new baseline state. That's new what baseline we want to go to. Is, is Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the coherence. Mm -hmm. In heartfulness, we have something called uh, a practice called constant remembrance, which mm -hmm. is basically making it your baseline yeah. state, making yeah. that. Uh, right. And when, once it becomes your baseline, then these are things we can measure. You start mm -hmm. seeing changes in the pattern of the rhythm. You start seeing genetic changes. These types of things, the real baseline, and then that becomes our way of being, hmm. right? And it doesn't mean that we can't still get frustrated or impatient, but we quickly come back to that. Yeah, exactly. Percent. We know that that is an aberration. Yeah. Feeling of yeah, frustration yeah, and is and an aberration. And that starts feeling uncomfortable. Feeling angry is an aberration. And you yeah, and that feels uncomfortable then. Absolutely. Because it's out of your, your, Absolutely. your baseline. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So we just call it baseline shifts. You know, it's, it's something we can measure scientifically. And I mean, the practices between heart math and heartfulness are a lot, are very, very aligned, you know, so. Uh, I mean, we would teach, you know, and again, we, we're working in 3D audiences that in groups that consciousness isn't even a word they know of, think about, right, mm. or spirituality, mm. or I mean, this, this is not something they're mm. interested in, comfortable yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, or schools in the United States, you you don't dare go in with any type of thing. It even smacks of a religious or a spiritual connotation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the feedback is so. I know it's different here in India, but yeah, yeah. Not in, not in no, the but US. even now, I think the there's so much cultural contact that even here it's pretty much similar. You know, you go. Uh, I have a teenage daughter, so uh, you know their concepts. You don't approach it in that way. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but it, it's just. Um, uh, it's just not acceptable because yeah. it's, but in the language of science and the language of self-regulation and, and improving our performance, then that's all fine. Right. So. Absolutely. So that's kind of the, uh, the backdoor approach and it's very spiritual, but without ever using that, that yeah. word as we are helping them get aligned with who they really are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, if I, if I may, I'm going to just finish that. So we, we did all these experiments in the, so kind of like the living room level, you know, mm -hmm. how we're, we're energetically communicating. So I'm kind of go back to where I was a little while ago. This is what led to the Global Co uh, Coherence Initiative. Mm. To, to, so we know where we can measure this stuff locally. Well, can we measure it globally? So that was where we started doing the, the magnetometers around the earth. And, and just to kind of come back to that for a minute, uh, now that we know we're 
oscillating or vibrating at the same frequency as the field lines of the earth in our hearts, you know, time travel back to science class again and you have tuning forks. And every, most people have done this or seen it or know what I'm talking about where you, if you have two tuning forks in the same frequency, you tap one and the other magically starts to vibrate, right? Of course. Yeah. I mean, we all know that. Mm. But what that's actually demonstrating is called resonant coupling, which means that two systems that vibrate at the same frequency, you can transfer energy and information between those two oscillating systems. It's the way radios work. And I'm an old guy. I remember back when we used to have to turn Hammer knobs radio. on radios. Yes, yes. You had to tune in the station, yes. right? I mean, all you're doing is uh, changing. Just the, a little shift and you lost it. Yeah. and that, But you're tuning hmm. the front end of that device in, in radio language to be resonant with the frequency of interest. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, where we're sitting here now, how many of these invisible magnetic vibrations are going on? All the cell phones and the, you know, yeah, they're absolutely. all here. They're here mm -hmm. right now. Mm. So the way your cell phone works or, or any radio, right, is you tune it to the be resonant with that wave and you instantly transfer the energy and information, amplify it up when we're listening to the radio station or having our cell phone call. Right? I mean, that's how it works. So we, we now have the basic, simple understanding physics of how we as humans can be interacting and transferring energy and information both directions with the Earth's energetic systems. And us. Now, there's no question that we're affected by the rhythms in the Earth's fields. Hmm. Hundreds, hundreds of studies on this. We don't like it when we're in disturbed fields. Um, uh, our physiology and our, our mental functions and all hmm. this are disturbed hmm. in that. But what I'm suggesting, this is one of the hypotheses of the Global uh, Coherence Initiative, is that it's a two-way street. We're also feeding information into hmm. the global field. We all are. We're all contributing to that. So one of the kind of sayings that's emerged now out of that work is, be, you know, what are you feeding the field? Mm. Right? So we encourage people to, once they get this, to just pause throughout the day as often as you can remember to do so and just ask yourself, what am I feeding the field? Mm. You know, is it vibrations of kindness and appreciation and deep listening? Or am I feeding the field frustration and impatience and in some cases hate and anger? Because uh, it... Uh, Part two of that is it matters. We can measure the effects of this. Um, and we can measure how in sync we are with the earth, with the rhythms of the earth. These are all published studies showing that. In fact, one of my favorites is that when we spend just 15 minutes in a heart coherent state, that that increases the synchronization with the rhythms in the earth's field for the next 24 hours. And I won't go into the details here, but just because of time, but I think we can intuitively get that it's good to be in sync with the, the mm. environment we're in, right? Absolutely. The, the energetic environment. And so everyone is actually contributing. Yeah, everybody. And it's not just when we're meditating. Here's another key thing. We are always connected to the field. And it's wonderful when we come together to do meditations like we're doing here at this event or or that I know Heartfulness does, you know, transformations on, I think, Sundays, Dodgy told me. Yes, every Sunday. Yeah, this is absolutely wonderful, and there really is. And we're, we can see this scientifically, an amplification effect of what we're pulsing the field with uh, when, we, when we do it together. And we're in a coherent field that is pulsing the planetary field uh, more um, in a nonlinear amplified way. However, we're always connected to the field. So when we're not meditating... Right. Whatever we're doing is contributing. Yeah. Right. There you are driving and you get the traffic jam and you might be feeling a little frustrated and yeah. that's also feeding the field. Right. Or you're watching the news uh, and you're getting triggered by, you know, or feelings of the way so and you know, whoever it is, whatever side of this you're on are, are being mistreated or treated and the anger and the uh, that, that, that that's also feeding the field. And it's, that's why, you know, we have a global field environment. That um, is, I, I would say right now is kind of dropping in frequency a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. That, and you can kind of certainly you can see that in the in the Western world. It's a. Uh, no, I think it's uh, all over the globe. Actually. Yeah, I think so too. It's a, it's a planetary mm -hmm. it's a planetary vibration that we're talking about. And uh, although we've got it's really the two worlds in the same world, right? So you've got you know a, a more aligned, more coherent field being built within the structures of a field that um, kind of a way of thinking of it is. Uh, Maybe an appropriate word would be the dignity frequency mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. dropping. Mm -hmm. You know, in the U.S., for example, um, the the 
just basic civility has definitely changed. I mean, and we've gotten used to it. That's what's the scary part. Mm. So it's uh, the baseline. <laughs> well, yeah, right. But mm. it's and it's that drop. So it's mm. part of the shift, right? Mm. That that has to happen. You know, like um, you know, there's just crazy things going on in the U.S. now. Um, um, you know, like robberies in daylight. You know, people going in and bikes and robbing stores and yeah, right yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, you know, that was just shocking. You mm. know, a while back. Now it's kind of normal, mm. right? Or school shootings, these types oh. mass shootings. Are, I mean, it was like. I can't believe this is happening. Not that many years ago, this was big news. Now it's normal. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, that's just, but if this is going on globally in different ways, and, and we we see the, uh, um, you know, different countries I mean, they're diff different furnitures and yes. vari variations, but it's a similar yes. frequency being manifested in Absolutely. different ways. Absolutely. So these two worlds, does the volume of people matter? I mean, these. Well, okay, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, and, it, and this leads into the latest set of tools in our, our toolbox for the research on, mm. I'll say, global consciousness and, and interconnectivity. Um, if I don't answer that, bring me back to it. But you might have heard of the Global Consciousness Project. Yeah. Yeah. So the Global Consciousness Project was started 20, some 25, 27 years ago by a good, very close friend of mine, uh, Dr. Roger Nelson at Princeton University. And a lot of people might be familiar with it, maybe not so much here in, in India, but it um, the way I think of it, I'll try and make this short and simple, is, is a globally distributed scientific instrument that are basically what are called random number generators. And this can sound, it's actually very hard to make a true random number generator, but at the end of the day, they're really simple. They're in the way to think of them as electronic coin flippers, right? Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we get a coin out, flip it a hundred times, thousand times, on average, you're going to come up 50 50, you know, if, you, sure, if yeah. it's fair and you're doing yeah. it right, right? But while you're doing that, you might get 10 heads in a row or 10 tails. Sure, sure. Right? So um, that's basically random number generators are doing, instead of heads or tails, it's ones or zeros. Mm -hmm. They just mm -hmm. do it really fast. Okay. So this, you had this global network of these devices flipping coins, you know, ones and zeros. And, it, and then there's all sending their data back to a server, time, tightly time synchronized to millisecond scale, right? And what GCP-1 found over, over analyzing hundreds, hundreds of events is that when an event occurs here on Earth that causes people to pay attention to it and feel something, and that's the key part, the emotion, the emotionality. Mental intention doesn't do much. It's when, we, when you have mass people's feeling something. Hmm. A terrorist attack, um, a global school shooting that gets you know like um, uh, big media attention, or, but also um, global peace days, right? Large scale organized meditations, um, all create what we now call network coherence. In other words, these devices, even though they're often thousands of miles apart, completely random, change their behavior. Hmm in a way that they start flipping ones or zeros at the same time in a correlated way above and beyond what you, you would expect for it to be possible. And that's what we call network coherence. So the, the statistics on GCP-1, as we lovingly call it now, are literally over, over a trillion to one odds against chance that this is a real thing. Wow. So the way I, I wow. encourage you to think about this is it's a, an instrument that's tuned in to the global consciousness field. Right, and it's um, I, we've been using metaphors like ocean waves and waves in the field, and uh, actually, an, an Indian lady here who um, is in Australia now is really smart. <laughs> One of those genius types has been doing some analysis of the data, and, and it, it's looking like this may not be a metaphor. I mean, wow. you might really be able to think of the global consciousness field as an energetic wave system. Um, so when we come together to meditate and we're, especially if we're adding love and compassion to the field, it's like we're pulsing the field with coherent waves in the field and we're all tuned into it. So that is helping to lift others. Uh, if you get where I'm going with yes, this. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, but the, the key thing is we can start to major this. So a few years ago, uh, Dr. Nelson uh, asked us to take over the, the project and, and I reluctantly agreed finally. Uh, it's a huge undertaking. But, so we spent a year or so um, just really looking at the, the the data from GCP one, you know what did we learn and you know uh, and then the next period 
saying, okay, well, what questions do we want to ask now? Because we had didn't want to do the same thing again for mm -hmm. 20 years. Mm -hmm. And technology has obviously advanced a lot in 25 years. Sure. I mean, hugely. So we created GCP2, which is actually, we have a bunch of devices here at the center, at the Heartfulness Center now, uh, as a, a node measuring this, this event. Yes, that. yes. And, well, um, so we made it a lot easier for people to become citizen scientists and participate. And uh, I can't go into all the details to enough time, but it's, it's a, we're asking a lot of new questions. And the reason I'm giving you this detail is to answer your question. Uh, in GCP1, we, Dr. Nelson was able to show that the size of the event, you know, there was the more people, you, know, you could get measures of this kind of roughly based on Twitter and these different kind of social uh, measures of how many people got, were involved in the event and feeling something. It was able to show a pretty direct correlation between the, the magnitude of the effect, you know, in the field and the number of people. Two things I need to say here, though. Um, one is my favorite study that Roger did uh, out of all the GCP, one of these hundreds of events, he rated them for their level of love and compassion. Okay. Right. So uh, like global peace days, ah, okay. lots of people meditating would be high in love and compassion. So yes, but yes. you got a bunch of those in one category. And he had the mid category, love and compassion, like Super Bowls, World Cups, big sporting events, a lot of emotion because we knew he had, right? But very little love and compassion going into the field. And then the low category would be uh, earthquakes, terrorist attacks, things types of, of the, course. the aftermath. And what he found, and this is really important, I think, is that the events that evoke love and compassion have a significantly, from a scientific perspective, greater effect on bringing coherence into the field than the, the medium or low events. Mm. I mean, this is really huge to understand Absolutely. what just got said The there. impact of this, yeah. Yeah. So it, one of the new hypotheses that we're able to now ask in GCP2, which is a much more, uh, many more devices, and, and we're doing clusters of devices around the world for, I won't go into all the scientific reasons, but it just, one of the hypotheses is it's not just about the number of people, but it's how coherent are they, heart coherent, mm. and do they have a shared intention? So we have a few experiments now. We're really just getting started. We don't have the full network of a thousand devices that we want to get out there. Um, and each of the new RNGs has four. So it'll be 4,000 RNGs where GCP-1 was at its max, like 75. So, so it's a huge jump, yeah. It's a huge jump. And we we have reason to, uh, some of the analysis we did, that the bigger, the number, the more the devices, the more sensitivity we have to detect these waves in the consciousness field. Sure. So we've already been doing some initial experiments to ask this question, can a small, highly focused, highly coherent group have as large, maybe even larger effects than, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands, millions, mm, mm. you know, that by a mass media event, you know, people all over the place. And and, uh, and so far the answer is yes. Mm. Data's looking good. Relatively small groups. Uh, some of my favorite slides now are showing, in fact, I'm gonna, I'll show some of it in the presentation I'm doing tomorrow here. Um, can modulate the global field. Yeah. But these are groups that have been really practicing heart coherence and using wow. the devices to get coherent. And, and we, we Small uh, focused group. Yeah, like, like say 2,000 people. Wow. That, uh, with the shared intention of that, in, in the one experiment I'll show tomorrow, the intention was to add love and compassion to the planetary consciousness field to help lift the baseline uh, mm. of humanity's consciousness. Mm. And uh, just a beautiful effect, you know, right when the meditation started, you say, this huge network coherence change. So, I wonder if it and, also has an impact as to the, the, the sway or the influence of the person also. Like suppose you've got a president in a coherent state. Uh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> in fact, some of the GCP1 data, you also, we can also look at long, what we call long-term trends in the data. Mm. And... Uh, that's a pretty clear correlation between presidential ratings and, and the data. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating. We could actually go on, but the time for the plenary yeah. is coming up. Yes. And thank you so much for taking so much time out. And it's it's just such a fascinating journey. It's, it's such an amazing work that you're doing. I mean, it's oh, uh, it's really like it's really like the like the world has been hypothesizing, and now HeartMath is going ahead and giving the yeah. putting the figures and facts there. Yeah. Well, and, and all of our work is really about trying to um, help love go viral.
Mm. I mean, that just really is what it gets down to. And, and uh, definitely. And that's such a worthy takeaway, even from an event like this, the yeah. Global Spirituality Month. Yeah. Let yeah. love go viral. Yeah. And uh, and that can get, be very practical. Let's start being kinder to each other. And, Absolutely. And, uh, well, you have been very kind. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was my lovely. pleasure, my honor to, to be here. It really, it truly is. Thank you for tuning into this episode of KanaCast. Do subscribe to KanaCast on YouTube, Instagram, and Spotify. Until the next episode, from the entire KanaCast team, Namaste and goodbye.